Um, anyway, tonight we come to the last of the teachers of the past, the last one we're going to talk about, and the last of the Japanese teachers on the refuge tree um, that we're going to talk about, Kukai. Um, so Kukai in Japanese literally means sea sky. I can't remember which way around it is. One of those syllables means sea, and the other one means sky. What a lovely name. Uh, sea sky. And it's very apt for someone who, as we'll see, had a really deep feeling for nature, for whom an appreciation of nature and the beauty and spaciousness and awesome sort of mystery of nature, the silence of it, of the natural world, was very much part of his practice, connecting with that was very much part of his practice. And this guy, Kukai, was also known as Kobo Daishi. Um, he's very popularly known as Kobo Daishi in Japan. Um, so Daishi is a lofty title. Daishi is a lofty title that means um, it's, it's conferred on the greatest Buddhist masters in Japan. Um, but apparently there's a popular saying in Japan that uh, Kukai stole the title Daishi so that nobody else could really, really use it, although it was bestowed on other, some other people. Um, Kobo means to spread the Dharma widely. So he's the great Buddhist teacher who spread the Dharma widely. And um, that name only ever refers to one man, and that's Kukai. Um, he's one of the most popular and respected figures in, in, Jap in Jap Japanese Buddhism, not just, Buddhism, not just for his spiritual teachings and his practice, but also for what we might call his worldly achievements. Um, he had a huge impact on Japanese culture. He was a leader who could get things done, even when others couldn't. Um, even when it came to mobilising people for big civil engineering projects, as we'll see. <laughs> um, um, and the style of Buddhism that Kukai introduced into Japan it, it was what was called, what is called Tantric Buddhism, uh, or Vajrayana Buddhism. I haven't got time to go into a lot of detail about what that actually means, but I need to say something about it for anyone who's relatively new. Otherwise, it's impossible to explain what he was on about, basically. Um, Vajrayana Buddhism, tam Tantric Buddhism, very briefly, was the sort of third major style of Buddhism, as it were, to develop over time. Um, so it's a later form of Buddhism that developed out of Mahayana Buddhism. Um, so people often talk about the three yanas. Yana means vehicle or way, the three vehicles or the three ways. Firstly, there's the more conservative style of Buddhism that still survives in Southeast Asia. Um, called by its detractors, as to say, not by itself, the Hinayana, the lesser, the lesser vehicle. Um, then we have the development of the Mahayana. Um, the so-called great vehicle or great way, that's what it called itself, um, the great vehicle or the great way, um, which although it's sometimes seen as a new development, um, is in some ways closer, in some ways closer perhaps to the original spirit of Buddhism, um, at a time when some of the older schools have got maybe a bit literalistic in their approach, a bit too attached to the letter and not enough to the spirit. Um, and then from that Mahayana, which was an attempt to sort of get back to something more original, from that Mahayana, well, over time we get the development of the Vajrayana, the diamond vehicle, or the diamond way, the way of the Vajra. And um, one aspect of Mahayana Buddhism is that it opens up this vast mythic perspective. Um, it incorporates all sorts of archetypal Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Um, who represent aspects of the enlightened mind and that we can encounter in meditation or in visionary experience, but who, well, as far as we know, didn't exist in the flesh. And it sees things in terms not just of the individual human being and their spiritual progress, it sees practice um, as a being about well, the whole universe, about all beings become, becoming more enlightened, the whole universe, if you like. And it encourages us to see our practice in that way as not just being about me, but about, if you like, the evolution of consciousness on this planet or maybe beyond. 
Um, so the Mahayana gives us this incredibly inspiring, huge perspective. But the possible problem is that maybe it can become a bit too highfalutin, um, a bit too distant from the realities of everyday life and everyday practice and the everyday world. Maybe we could spend our time sort of being all cosmic and uh, mythic, but never really engage with the task in front of our nose or the person in front of our nose. Maybe that's that danger. So in the same way that the Mahayana was needed to get back something to something closer to original Buddhism, or the spirit of the, of the Buddha's original teachings, what a time when maybe it drifted a bit, the Vajrayana did the same with the Mahayana by connecting practice very, very firmly with concrete reality. Um, getting it down from the realm of cosmic ideals to the, to the here and now. Um, so it, stood, it still stayed in touch with that sort of archetypal, mythic dimension of the Mahayana it grew out of. Um, but it focused on how we make this apply in the specifics of everyday life. How we relate to a real flesh and blood teacher, for example, rather than um, an ideal bodhisattva. Um, how we practice and express our mythic vision in this difficult situation. Um, how we make this task that we're engaged in um, our practice, how we make that the way we can grow and develop. Um, how we create powerful bonds with these particular flawed people who are our Sangha, rather than with um, some sort of ideal um, group that only exists in our imagination. Uh, so the real Vajrayana practitioner, he, keeps up, he or she keeps up a powerful connection with um, a mythical archetypal Buddha or Bodhisattva figure that is, that, that is part of their practice. But at the same time, they express that very much, that archetypal dimension, through the actual concrete happenings of everyday life. Everyday life is seen as a practice. Any task we're doing is, if you like, the arena for our practice. So, in a way, you could say that the Vajrayana connects the archetypal with the everyday, connects the everyday with the archetypal. Um, or, as the title of our talk apparently says in the program, um, it makes the mundane and sacred. Um, goes beyond the illusion that ordinary everyday life is a grey, unimportant, boring routine from which we can escape into a lovely, fluffy spiritual world. <laughs> um, it sort of wakes us up to the fact that seen properly the whole world and the whole of existence is a miracle, a marvel, in which we are spiritual beings. There's nothing unimportant. The world and our life is always full of deep mythic meaning. Everything we do gives us opportunity to express that. So that vision is brought out in the Mahayana. Um, but it's not something new. It's already there in the Buddha's teaching. Uh, Tantric Buddhism just re-emphasised it, when maybe the tradition was in a bit danger of being too ethereal and otherworldly. Um, and that's a perspective that we need too. Uh, we need to, have to see our practice in mythic terms, have that big perspective, uh, long-term vision, but we need to have an, a sense of the archetypal dimension uh, in what we're doing now. Um, we need to express it in the particular details of our our life, what we do for a living, and how we do it, uh, how we deal with the problems and difficulties uh, of people, and how we deal with people we don't like, um, how we help create this Sangha, how we help spread the Dharma in this city. Um, so Sangha Ashta has said that in many ways we, the Sri Ratna community, are a Vajrayana uh, spiritual movement, um, which is why we try to create things like team-based right livelihoods, um, in which people can make their work part of their practice, uh, make the challenges and the stress even of work uh, a way to go beyond our limitations um, and our idea of ourselves and 
and why we have communities in which um, the difficulties that we inevitably have with other people become our practice. So we have gone down to the here and now. But wherever we work and however we live, we need to do that. We need to connect. We need to connect the two. Uh, we need to use the challenges of everyday life as our arena for practice. Or well, to use a Sheffield analogy, we need to make the challenges of everyday life, the crucible in which we melt ourselves down <laughs> to come out something brighter and purer and stronger. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what, that's what I'd like to bring out in this talk. That's what I'd like to bring out in this talk. How Kukai made the mundane sacred if you like, how he brought together everyday life and worldly activity so there was no separation between the two, how he helped people connect with the wonder of the world around us and our everyday existence and how he expressed himself in the world, being very effective in the world, trying to be as effective as possible in the world requires us to get over ourselves and grow into something a bit bigger, uh, to leave behind our self imposed so I'll talk about that aspect of Kukai and his teachings and what we, can, what we can pick up from him, what we can learn from him, how we can learn to have a bit of that in our practice. But before I do that, I need to tell you a bit about the man and his life. Um, so Kukai was born on Shikoku Island towards the south of Japan um, in the year 774 of the Christian era which makes him the earliest of the Japanese teachers on the refuge tree, although he's the one we're looking at last. Um, he was born into one of the very noblest aristocratic clans in Japan, who had produced many famous generals, statesmen, poets and scholars. Um, and when he was 14, his brilliant mind uh, made an impression on one of his uncles, um, a man who was a distinguished scholar, and uh, the tutor to the crown prince of Japan. Um, and this, this guy, who was, you know, as I say, a distinguished scholar, tutor to the crown prince, took Kukai into his home in the capital from the sticks where he was living, brought him to the capital, and educated him. So he joined a circle of privileged pupils. Um, and he learned Chinese, history, poetry, philosophy, and especially the Confucian classics, apparently. Um, then when he was 17, he entered the very highest educational institute in Japan, um, a college in the capital that existed to educate the sons of, aristoc of the aristocracy to fit them to become high government officials. Um, so he was being groomed as a high flyer. <coughs> Um, to become one of the top members of the ruling class in Japan. Um, but while Kuko was at the college, he also came across Buddhist texts. Um, and these things made a really deep impression on him. So one biography tells us that he felt that all the other things he was learning was, I quote, only the dregs left over from the men of old, um, which do little benefit in this life and will be of no benefit afterwards. Um, and he thought it was essential to learn the ultimate truth of the Dharma. And in fact, sometime around here, he wrote, uh, he wrote a... Um, he wrote a sort of article which survives to this day, which is a discussion between a Buddhist and a Confucian. The Confucian being all about how you run the state and uh, practical things like that. And the Buddhist looking beyond that with a transcendental perspective. So it's, a, you know, it's his exploration of why Buddhism is superior to Confucianism and why he was going to be a Buddhist. So he became a Buddhist layman, apparently. In other words, he, uh, he wasn't formally a monk. But he left the college and he left his glittering prospects for a future career and he went off alone into the deep mountains to practice the Dharma and to meditate. We're told he had a number of visions. Um, in one he saw the sword of the Dharma heading straight for him. Poor guy. 
not much choice, I suppose, after that. In another, apparently the planet Venus came down out of the sky and entered his mouth. I don't know what that was about, but it had a big effect on him. Um, anyway, we don't know a lot of detail about his life for a few years, but we do know that he spent time both meditating in the mountains and forests intensively and also studying the Dharma, studying the Dharma, which presumably meant contact with civilizations, Buddhist temples, um, monasteries. And sometime over the next 10, maybe more years, he became a monk, or he became a novice monk. He cut off his hair and he took on the 10 precepts, which incidentally are the same 10 precepts that all the members of the true Rana community take on today. So he went around, he studied the Dharma a lot, he meditated, but he wasn't satisfied. He wasn't satisfied with the Dharma he came across. He felt that he wasn't getting the full, the full truth. Uh, he wasn't getting what he really needed. Um, then we're told that on one of his retreats he prayed earnestly before an image of the Buddha for help to resolve his doubts and find the teaching he needed. And then that night he had a dream. And in his dream this man appeared before him and said, the Mahavarochana Sutra is the doctrine you have been searching for. The Mahavarochana Sutra is the doctrine you have been searching for. So he set off in search of the Mahavarochana Sutra. And um, some scholars say, well, that must not have been easy to find because it had only just been translated into Japanese. Um, so maybe we can imagine him walking from monastery to monastery. Um, from library to library, asking all the time for the Mahavarochana Sutra and always being told, never heard of it, Gov. Never heard of it. And then at last he comes to a monastery where the librarian says, Well, you, that's funny you should say that. You're in luck. We've just got a copy of that. We've just, one of our monks has just come back from visiting another teacher and he made a copy of it and we've got it here in the library. So at last, He's got a copy. Uh, here it is, he has it in his hands. He takes it, this is going to be the answer. It came to him in a dream, this is going to be the answer. He takes it to a quiet place. With great excitement, he opens it. He starts to read it. And he couldn't understand what on earth he was talking about. Um, which actually, if you've ever seen it, isn't surprising, because I couldn't either. Um, it's not surprising. Um, it's not a straightforward document with some nice clear teachings, you know, one, A, B, it, it's not like that at all. It's more poetry and myth than it is a set of rational teachings. To begin to understand it, you need at very least a background in Tantric Buddhism. Um, and you need guidance of a teacher, you need the oral tradition, like a lot of things, just having a text won't do. You need the oral tradition, you need instruction in the meditations that it just alludes to. You actually need a human teacher to understand this thing. So that must have been a huge disappointment for Kukai. Um, but Kukai was not somebody who gives up easily. And he heard, he'd heard, that there was a style of Buddhism based on the Mahavarojana Sutra that was flourishing in China. In China, he would be able to find a teacher who could tell him what this sutra was all about. Sutra that appeared to him in a dream. So the next time the government sent a delegation to China, which was when he was about 30, Kukai volunteered to go. Um, so the Japanese government apparently fairly regularly sent a small fleet of ships to China, uh, which at that time was the centre of civilization as far, as far as China was concerned. But apparently Japanese shipbuilding was so bad and Japanese navigation techniques were so poor that, and the danger was just so, the, 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 the trip was so dangerous that whenever one of these trips was, was, was planned, um, the court officials were thrown into a panic in case they were chosen to go. Um, <laughs> some ran away and had to be punished for disobeying orders. And others had nervous breakdowns because of the stress. Um, so maybe it's not surprising that Kukai volunteering should be chosen to go. Um, to 
cut a long story short, he uh, made it to China despite the ship getting lost and him having to spend several months stranded in a marsh somewhere. Um, he made it to China and he succeeded in finding a teacher who could explain to him the Mahavarajna Sutra and introduce him to tantric practice. This man was 60 years old, nearing the end of his life, and he soon recognised Kukai as the pupil he'd been looking for. Uh, someone who could really continue his mission, uh, the person he'd been looking for to continue his mission. And what is more, somebody who could take that mission and those teachings to a whole new country, who could just do infinite good with them, a lot, a lot of good with them. So he adopted Kukai as his successor, um, taught him everything he knew, initiated him to all the meditations he knew, and, and Kukai felt a deep bond of gratitude to this man uh, for the rest of his life. But then after a while this teacher died, um, making Kukai his successor, and Kukai returned to Japan, um, taking many texts and paintings and painted mandalas and other artwork with him. And to cut another long story short, uh, Kukai then introduced this new style of Buddhism in Japan. And despite quite a lot of difficulties, eventually, when he was about 45, um, High up in a place called Mount Koya, he established the first monastery of his new Buddhist school, um, which became called the Shingon School, the School of the True Word. Okay, so what was Kukai teaching? What was Kukai teaching in his new monastery? Uh, and what has that got to do with the theme of our talk? So, to explain this, and for the better, especially for the benefit of people who are relatively new, I need to take a little detour into the basics of tantric, some of the basics of tantric Buddhism. A little detour. Um, so in Mahayana Buddhism, from which Vajrayana developed, we find all sorts of archetypal Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who embody some aspect of the enlightened mind. Uh, so in this series we've looked at Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, and Vajrapani, the Bodhisattva of Strength and Energy. Um, Tantric Buddhism took this even further, took this even further. And there were hosts of figures people could meditate on. In, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, for example, there are to this day loads of figures. Um, meditate on to, to connect with some aspect of enlightenment. And one particular feature of Vajrayana, of, of Tantric Buddhism, is that these figures are often organised in mandalas, in what are called mandalas, sort of um, spatial arrangements. In a mandala, there's usually a central figure surrounded by other figures who, in a way, represent aspects of that central figure. So they're not really separate. They're not quite the same, but they're not separate. They're aspects of the central figure. So there's a certain sort of logic to a mandala, which you might hang on to when we get to what Kukai, Kukai's approach to practice. So then, these other, the various figures are not different, but they're sort of different. They are different. An analogy that's often used is a little white light that gets split up by a prism into lots of different colours. Um, and the most well-known of these mandalas is the mandala, what's called the mandala of the five Buddhas. Um, in the Mandala of the Five Buddhas, in each of the four cardinal directions, you've got a Buddha, an archetypal Buddha, who represents some aspect of enlightenment. So, for example, in the East, you have the blue Buddha, Akshobhya, associated with a sort of cool, clear, above-it-all wisdom, the mirror-like wisdom. And then opposite him, on the other side of the Mandala, you've got the red Buddha, Amitabha, representing... Um, uh, the emotions, warm emotions related to love and passion. So blue for cool and red for warm. Apparent opposites um, for which these different colours sort of bring out different aspects. And so the enlightened mind, what the mandala tells us is that the enlightened mind includes these two apparent opposites. Um, but for us unenlightened people, for practical purposes of developing these qualities, maybe we have to treat this cool wisdom and this warm love as separate things, because that's the only way we can sort of relate to them for the time being. Although in the enlightened mind, they're not separate. 
So the, the figures on the edge of the five Buddha mandala are different colours representing different aspects of enlightenment. And in the centre of the mandala, there's the white Buddha, Varochana, um, the white light that combines all the other colours. Um, so the central Buddha who combines all of the other Buddhas of the mandala, all of the other aspects of him. All the Buddhas like Akshobhya and Amitabha are aspects of the central Buddha, Virochana. And the name Virochana means illuminator. It means the source of light. It means something that lights things up. I've also seen it translated as sun. Um, so the sun lights things up and the sun is at the centre of the solar system. Um, so this Virochana, who's at the centre of the most well-known mandala in Vajrayana Buddhism, is also the Virochana who's brought out in the Mahavarochana Sutra that Kukai was told would solve his problems. Um, Maha means great, so it's the great Varochana Sutra, the discourse on the great illuminator, the great source, the discourse on the great source of light. And for Kukai, and I suppose yeah, for Kukai, particularly Kukai sort of developed this teaching, for Kukai, Mahavirochna is what is in Buddhism is called the Dharmakaya, the nature, the very nature of reality. Um, the nature of reality itself, which is the same thing as the enlightened mind. Um, so Kukai's interpretation of the Mahavirochna Sutra offers us this sort of mythic vision, this mythic and poetic vision of everything in which all beings and everything in the universe um, are manifestations of Mahavirochna. They're all manifestations of the nature of things, the nature of reality, or the enlightened mind for that matter. Um, so he talks about all beings as what he calls body minds, not body or mind. They're not separate, according to him. They're aspects of the same thing. And all body minds are manifestations of the body mind of the nature of things, the body mind of the nature of reality, or Mahav mythically Mahavirochana, um, speaking mythically or poetically. Everything, every being is an aspect, is a manifestation of the body mind of Mahavirochana. And the trouble, of course, is that we're all cut off from that. We're all, that might be our fundamental nature, but we're all well and truly cut off from that by our past karma, our accumulated unskillfulness, and our sheer ignorance and small-mindedness. Um, we're all trapped in our own dark and deluded body-minds, cut off from the great source of illumination, um, our original. So that isn't a completely new idea in Buddhism. In the Mahayana Pranyaparamita text, the Perfection of Wisdom text, we hear that the nature of all things and all beings is described as suchness. So suchness is a nonsense word um, used to say, well, anything we say about this is going to be, you know, you're misinterpreting, so we just use a nonsense word to point to um, the mysterious, inexplicable, ineffable nature of things. Um, and this suchness is not just some neutral quality, it's described in some of the Pranyaparamita Sutras as deeply peaceful, blissful, a fountain of positive qualities, nirvanic. Um, so if we could but see it, all, all things have this quality of nirvana, all things have the quality of the enlightened mind. We could say that all things are sacred. All things are holy, if those words have positive connotations for us. Uh, if those words don't have positive connotations, if they have negative connotations, we need to find different words that carry the same sense of something mysterious and imbued with beauty and deep meaning and value, something beyond the mundane, um, beyond our usual way of thinking, beyond our usual dulled awareness in which we walk through a miracle, treating it as great routine. Um, so the way Kukai expressed this was through this mythic and poetic vision um, in which all beings and all things are manifestations of the body and mind of 
the Mahavarochna, the great illuminator, at the centre of the mandala. He's not saying we're already Buddhas or anything like that. We're deeply cut off by our karma and our ignorance. But according to Buddha, according to Kukai, we can align ourselves with Varochna, with Mahavarochna. We can allow Varochna, the enlightened mind, or the nature of reality, um, to manifest through us. And the way we do that is to align our body, speech, and mind with the body, speech, and mind of Varochna. Um, so that we become manifestations of the great illuminator. The body, speech, and mind of Mahavarochna he called the three mysteries. So the three mysteries. We align ourselves with the three mysteries. Our practice, the way we allow the enlightened mind to express itself through us, is to align our body, speech, and mind with the three mysteries. That was, that was the basis of his school. Um, and to be frank, we are not going to relate to many of the ways that Kukai's Shingon school taught you, sh you, would, you would align yourself with the body, speech, and mind of Varochna. Um, Shingon practice involves these really complex rituals and mantras and visualizations involving loads of detailed mudras or gestures and uh, so on and so forth. But some as many aspects of the practice he recommended um, would be familiar to us. They would be familiar to us. So one way we align ourselves with Mahavarochna, according to him, um, is by practicing the precepts. Um, Kukai saw this as vital. Unskillfulness of any sort he saw as just the, the main bit of the barrier that cuts us off from the three mysteries, stops the three mysteries manifesting through us. Um, and then we might, we might not want to elaborate, to do elaborate rituals, but we can also connect with the deep meaningfulness of um, our every action, if you like. Just treating our every action as part, almost like a ritual, it's almost part of it. We do, our ordinary actions are very much part of our spiritual practice, even if we think they're boring routines. They can be expressions of our deepest potential, if we think that way. And then there's meditation, of course. So um, Kukai saw uh, Mahavarochna as being, in his myth, that Mahavarochna is always there in deep meditation, waiting to be contacted. Um, and through meditation, we can experience the samadhi, the meditation of Mahavarochana. We could connect with the enlightened mind and um, sort of ride on its coattails um, because the enlightened mind is everywhere, including in us. Um, so when we sit in meditation, we align our mind with the enlightened mind. We connect, we can use it to connect with the deep compassion of the enlightened mind. Um, we can connect with the expansive, silent spaciousness and freedom of the enlightened mind. And when we encounter, if we encounter, if we're lucky enough to encounter archetypal Buddhas in our meditation, these two, according to Kukai, are manifestations of Mahavarochna. Mahavarochna is trying to get through to us in any way he can, basically. Um, we can align ourselves with the enlightened mind by being open to the way it manifests itself in our experience in the world and in other people. So in Kukai's vision, the enlightened mind, the nature of things, Mahavarochana, is not just some passive principle. It's active. It's always trying to get through to us. Um, he talks about how the Dharmakaya is always preaching. Preaching might be a bit of an unfortunate word for us. Dharmakaya is always saying, no, you'd be good. It's not, it's not doing that. Um, by preaching, he doesn't mean even just teaching through words. For Kukai, whatever was beautiful partakes of the nature of enlightenment, partakes of the nature of the Buddha. So we can connect with the enlightened mind by opening ourselves up to the beauty of things, by spending time in nature, by steeping ourselves in natural beauty, as he did, and letting it affect us. We align ourselves with the enlightened mind, which is manifesting through that, through that beauty. So, for Kuka, the enlightened mind tries to get to us through other people, tries to teach us through other people, through books, through works of art, 
through mantras. Um, these can all be manifestations of Mahavarochana. These can all be ways the enlightened mind preaches to us, tries to get through to us. Uh, so if we meet us, if we meet a significant person who just says just what we had to, what we needed to hear at that time, well, that's Mahavarochana. Um, or if we come across a book that is just what we need to read, oh well, Mahavarochana is teaching in lots of different or if, um, if a painting speaks to something really deep inside us, um, that's all the activity of the enlightened mind trying to get through to us. The artist must have, to some extent, been aligned with the body, speech and mind of Verochina. Uh, at least while he was working, so that a painting, even by an otherwise flawed individual, can also be a, an expression of the enlightened mind. Um, and then, of course, the enlightened mind tries to get through to us directly by speaking as a sort of still, small voice in our hearts. It speaks to us through what we call Shraddha uh, for Kukai. So Shraddha is our connection, our sense of a connection with something um, higher and more, more valuable than ourselves. Um, a sense of loving certain values and qualities and wanting to move towards fulfilling our potential, a sort of deep pull in a particular direction, that's Shraddha. And for Kukai, that's, uh, that's Mahavarochana. He's doing that. Um, that's the deep wisdom of Mahavarochana trying to get through to us as it manifests in us. Although we're usually too busy or obsessed or something to pay any attention, we just go, oh, shut up. <laughs> I'm off down. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to watch the football. <laughs> Um, so, well, okay, that's a bit about mm, Kukai's teaching. And we might find this, this vision of uh, all things, uh, the Ukraine, uh, whatever, the Ukrainian centre forward, all things being the very nature of things. Uh, being manifestations of Mahavarochana, being manifestations of the, the deep nature of things. We might find that inspiring, or we might find it deeply off-putting, uh, a bit too much like pantheism, a bit too much like there's a god hidden in there somewhere, not even particularly hidden, actually. Um, when we hear, we in the West, when we hear sort of that sort of Buddhist attempt to, to mythologize, to, to, to present a deep myth that you can live by, we tend to immediately try and turn it into philosophy, immediately turn it into some sort of scientific statement about the nature of things. Um, we think in concrete terms, we're being, we think we're being told the way things are in a literalistic fashion. Um, but Kukai's vision is not meant to be metaphysics. It's not meant to be metaphysics. All good Buddhists should know that uh, we can't glibly explain the nature of things in words. Okay? So when we come across something that sounds like an explanation of the nature of things, um, it's not. All we can do is imagine our way into, into reality in a way that's going to work spiritually for us. This is basically a way of imagining, we don't know what the universe is like, but we're imagining a sort of universe in which we can really get somewhere. We're, we're imagining, a, we're, we're creating a map of the universe that's going to help us to get somewhere um, in spiritual terms. So the question is not, is this the way things are? Because no description is the way things are. The question is, is this a useful way of looking at things? Um, is it a useful way of moving us towards enlightenment? Or, or, and I think the answer to that is a yes and no. Um, there are dangers, okay? There's a danger, there's a real danger if we were to take that too, take Kukai's vision too literally, as that's the way the world is. There's a real danger that we'd say, well, I'm already an aspect of Mahavarochana. Ah, what, does a, what does a manifestation of Mahavarochana need to do? Nothing. <laughs> Um, there's a real danger of that, um, and that you know, and, and, and people do fall into that um, that sort of that, that sort of uh, idea. So, but if we avoid that sort of literalism, well, I do think there are aspects that could be helpful because 
This is a way of looking at things that brings the world alive. It brings the world alive. It imbues the world with meaning. Um, it cuts through our deadening way of seeing things, opens our eyes to the fact that everything, even what we think of as mundane and boring, everything is miraculous, everything is mysterious, charged with meaning and beauty. If we think science has explained things, we got it wrong. All science does is tell you how certain things interact. And it doesn't, the world is an inexplicable miracle. Um, charged with meaning and beauty, if we can live it that way. Most of us have been educated to be crass materialists, by which I mean we think that matter is what's real, other things aren't. We see the world as dead. We see the outer world as dead. Dead, therefore, unimportant. Dead, therefore, boring. Um, well, Sanger Rashto has said that a world conceived of as dead, a universe conceived of as dead, is not a universe in which we have any real chance of becoming enlightened. Um, if we want to become enlightened, if we want to live in the sort of universe that allows us to become enlightened, we need to bring the world alive. We need to make the ordinary sacred, meaningful. Um, we need to see that even the what we think of as the inanimate world um, is part of a miraculous, living, meaningful reality. To live a really meaningful spiritual life, we need to see ourselves as part of a living universe in which beauty and spiritual values are built into the structure of things, not just something we sort of invented. Uh, in Kukai's terms, we, we maybe need to see things as aspects of and for Kukai, this obviously worked. This obviously worked really big time. He clearly succeeded in making the mundane sacred, in breaking down the barrier between spiritual practice and what we usually think of as worldly activity. Um, he uh, he made what's the question? He made he made his practice the spiritual life. He, he made his spiritual life activity, and he made activity his spiritual life. Um, Throughout his life, Kukai combined the two. He combined what we usually think of as spiritual practice. Living in remote hermitages, in distant monasteries, doing lots of meditation. He combined that with periods of intense, vigorous involvement in the world. He spent a lot of time in the capital. At one time, he was named as the main administrative officer of a whole region. He's often credited with having invented the Japanese syllabic alphabet. They use ideograms, but he's, he's credited with inventing the syllable alphabet. In fact, he, he may not have done that single-handed, it has to be said. He may not have done that single-handed, but he was instrumental in creating the Japanese syllable alphabet, which made a huge difference to Japanese culture. Um, he was a celebrated artist and calligrapher and poet. Um, he founded the first free school in Japan. He founded the first free school that accepted poor children and gave everybody food and accommodation. Um, he could really mobilise people. He could get dana flowing. He could mobilise people's best values to get things to happen. He was even an accomplished civil engineer, believe it or not. Um, in his native province of Sanuki, there was a reservoir that apparently was essential to the local farmers. They absolutely needed this to grow food for irrigation. It had been built about 100 years before, and they were having lots of trouble with it. They patched it up, they patched it up, but eventually it burst. Eventually it burst, and the dam, the dam burst, and there was no reservoir. Um, and the imperial court appointed a director to take charge of rebuild, rebuilding the dam. Um, but he found he just couldn't do it. I mean, it's a bit like Shantarakshita in Tibet. He just couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it. Um, the reservoir was too large and the workers were too few, it said in a letter. Um, and in desperation, absolute de this is causing great misery, it's causing hunger. In desperation, the governor of the province sent a letter to the court asking them to appoint Kukai to repair the dam. That's how highly regarded he was. In his letter, the, the governor of the province says, of Kukai, he says, religious people and all ordinary folk alike are delighted to receive his good influence. 
If he stays, a crowd of students assemble around him. If he goes, a multitude follows him. Farmers long for him as they do for their children. He has long been away from his native, native place, living in Kyoto. But if the people hear that the master is coming, they will run out to welcome him. I sincerely request that he be appointed director. God, somebody write something like that about me. <laughs> I mean, what a tribute to the man. What a tribute. And um, so he was. He was appointed director. And he managed to mobilise the people where, where the previous director had not immobilised the people to rebuild the dam. And I'm told it still exists to this day. Although it has been patched up a bit. Um, so, I mean, quite incredible, this combination of this inspiring, deeply spiritual practitioner who started a, a, really, a, really, a whole new school of, of, of Buddhism, founded loads of monasteries, was deeply influential on the spiritual life of Japan, and was clearly, from his writings, a very, very, um, yeah, very, very accomplished med a meditator. We've got that, and um, who could spend his love nature Lord being in nature, spent loads of time in the woods, in the mountains, loved meditating, and at the same time this man of action, um, who could mobilise gangs of people, coal communities to do major projects, who could get the money flowing in to start a free school and to, and to, and to build all these monasteries. Um, at the same time as being a scholar, an artist and a poet, any one of those would have been good enough. And together they just seem to add up to such a multifaceted man. They seem a contradiction. But for Kukai, I don't think there was a contradiction at all. Uh, because he had succeeded in making the mundane sacred. He had succeeded in breaking down the barrier between spiritual practice and activity. Um, for Kukai, if you could align yourself with the enlightened mind, if you could allow the enlightened mind to, to some extent come through you, uh, then your action would be part of the great activity of the enlightened mind. Um, if you worked in the world, little old you would be out of the picture. Um, you could go beyond all your self-imposed limitations and be really effective. Um, if you painted a picture or you wrote a poem, something of the enlightened mind could express itself through your mind and your hands. So that some of the deep beauty of the nature of things would come through and communicate itself. So for, for, for him, there wasn't that contradiction. There wasn't that contradiction that perhaps we see. His practice, uh, his spiritual practice was his activity, his activity was his spiritual practice two were the same thing. He was living in a world that was deeply imbued with, with beauty and meaning, where everything you did was imbued with beauty and meaning. Setting up a dam, starting a school. Um, the same beauty and meaning that you were connecting with in your meditation or when you spent time in nature absorbing the, the, the great beauty and silence of things. So, I mean, he's quite a remarkable practitioner. And I think there's real big elements of his, would you, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to recommend that we all go around thinking everything's a manifestation of Mahavirochana, but I think we need to find some way in to this idea of bringing the world alive, of seeing our connection with others. Um, so I'm going to finish with just reading a bit of something he wrote, okay, um, about the three mysteries, body, speech, and mind of Mahavirochana. So it says... The three mysteries pervade the entire universe, adorning gloriously the mandala of infinite space, being painted by the brushes of mountains, by the ink of oceans. Heaven and earth are the bindings of a sutra revealing the truth. Reflected in a dot are all things in the universe. Contained in the senses and mind is the sacred book. It is open or closed, depending on how you look at it. The sun and the moon shine forth in space and on the water, undisturbed by gales in the atmosphere. The notion that I and you will be erased and lost when the sea of our mind becomes serene through meditation and insight. So, that's a bit about Mahavirajana. 
other, about uh, Kukai and Mahabharata.